Hello, this is Stephen D. Russell of Wright Publishing. I'm here today to go back over the discussion from yesterday. We talked yesterday about how to start your tabletop RPG game company. So yesterday we talked about a lot of the business aspects of starting your own uh, tabletop RPG company. Um, really the hard and harsh stuff and if I came off a little harsh it's because I have found every time I have given this seminar when I've gone to conventions and given this exact speech and given this seminar it doesn't seem to get through to people sometimes so sometimes you have to be a little harsh you know drop some anvils on people's heads till they realize um, what you're talking about and that the, it's extremely important so that was about yesterday so today I'm here to crush your dreams as we move on to the second part I was gonna wait a week and get back to that but it was extremely extremely popular yesterday and I had feedback from people who did not want to wait for the next video so here we are um, to talk a little bit about starting your first project you know what's your you, you've created your business you've got all that stuff set up, you've got your business plan, you've mapped things out, just like we talked about in yesterday's video. But today we're talking about getting started. What is your first product going to be? Now let's assume you've done your market analysis and you've decided um, that let's just take something I don't produce for. And I'm going to pick on Monty Cook because he's been very kind to me before and let me do licensed stuff and he has an available license out there that you can take a look at. So it's and it's not something I produce stuff for, so you're not going to be competing with me if you take my advice. So let's say you decide you want to do an adventure for whatever system. It doesn't necessarily have to be Numenera, but let's just say it is. So let's decide that that's going to be your first thing. Stop. And you've created, uh, and even before that, let's say you're completely ignoring my advice because you've got a manuscript, or I've got a manuscript, Steve. It is awesome. It's the masterwork. It is the masterpiece of my existence. I'm totally ready to publish this manuscript because I've been working on it for 10 years. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. You need to learn about the publishing industry first. You need to learn all of the production things you don't know. You need to learn and understand what you don't know yet. You know, there's a lot of things I know after six years as a full-time uh, publisher. You know, we've been going at this since 2008, so it's been eight years that I've been in the publishing uh, industry with just right publishing. Not talking about my freelancing before that, but you know, and what I learned there. But there's still a lot that I'm still learning about the publishing industry you know you never stop learning so trust me there's stuff you need to learn and there's a big chunk of it you need to do at the beginning and I don't want you to waste learning on your manuscript I don't want you to make mistakes on your masterpiece I want you I want your dream project to come later and again talking about me being harsh before about you know starting with your dream project don't and I want to talk to you about a little bit of something um, let's talk about three things to give you examples of people who did not start out with their dream project as their, you know, very first thing you did. Okay. Um, I'll take three examples and I'll pull these from different places. Um, let's talk about the indie folks. Let's talk about, cause some, maybe some, no, let's, let's go to Pathfinder. Let's go to Pathfinder. Pathfinders. A lot of people know me for that. Um, Lisa Stevens, the CEO of Paizo, did not start her job in the RPG industry with uh, Paizo. That wasn't her first gig. Pathfinder was not her, the first book she published uh, by far. Um, you know, she was at Wizards of the Coast before she was at Paizo. You know, before even before the magazines and everything came out, came out then there was you know, she worked with Lion Rampart well before that, um, which eventually merged with White Wolf. You know, and the very first thing she did, as I understand it, I could be wrong about this, but were called whimsy cards. Um, and those eventually turned into what you have today are called plot twist cards. You know, that was years ago, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. 
okay? Her first thing was not Pathfinder. Her most success, you know, it wasn't the Pathfinder uh, role-playing game. It wasn't the Pathfinder adventure card game. It wasn't the f her first trip to the rodeo. That's why you need to start small. Um, going back to them, we were talking about the indie folks for all the people who love my who love my Amber Diceless thing. Fate was originally the idea of somebody wanting to play, uh, as I understand it, Amber uh, using the Fate system. Okay. It wasn't the first thing that Evil Hat did. Evil Hat, I think their first product was Don't Rest Your Head, which was an 82-page uh, black and white product with, you know, just photoshopped pictures, as I recall. Um, that doesn't mean it's not a great game. It's just mean, you know, it wasn't the Dresden Files. It wasn't uh, Fate Core. You know, it wasn't their very first kick out the door to, you know, what they're so well known for now. Um you know, those types of things, you know, White Wolf was originally a magazine that supported AD&D, you know, it wasn't all world of darknessy, you know, I could go on and on from everybody to Monty Cook starting out, you know, way back in the day to what he, you know, he had a company before Monty Cook Games, he had Malhavik Press, you know, you had, uh, even Call of Cthulhu's stuff was based on, you know, White Bear and Red Moon Dragon Pass, a board game, you know, um, Mark Miller's Traveler, um, Triplanetary was the first thing he did, um, Rop on a Thook and Razor Coast from Frog God Games, you know, the, the, if you look at their stuff going way back to Necromancer Games, you're talking about the Wizard's Amulet, you know, the first thing out your door is not your masterwork. Um, we talked a lot yesterday about uh, Cobalt Press and how excellent it is and how impressed I am with the company. And Steam and Brass was the first open design patronage project, which was a 64 print on demand at cost with only 70 backers, as I recall. Um, that kind of thing is what I'm talking about. I don't want to give you a whole list of people that, you know, because I don't want to bombard you with that or waste your time, but um, I can turn it into a monster trivia game. Go read Designers and Dragons for all of that. Please do. It's well worth the read. But it's to get across to you that the first thing you need to do does, should not be your dream project. You need to crush that dream for right now. Set it aside. You need to start with something small. You need to learn about what your production time is going to be. And the only way you're really, really going to learn that for you is to actually sit down and do it. And I'm not talking about having the manuscript finished and going right ahead and doing the rest of the production. I'm talking about starting from scratch. So you really know, you know, how many words you can write out per day doing what you're doing. You know, that kind of production cost. You know, even if you're just hiring everybody, you still need to know what, you know, your favorite freelancer's turnaround time is going to be. Can he turn around around in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Does it take him six months? Does it take him two years to produce a manuscript? You know, I have guys who it takes two years for them to produce, you know, a manuscript. It, it'll be a great manuscript, but you better know that that's how long it takes him so that um, you can prepare stuff like that. Um, you know, it may take you a week for, for an artist to give you a finished thing. It may take 60 days. You need to learn about which artists those are and you need to start those things with small production scales. Also, starting small gives you some income um, without you investing every nickel and dime you have. You know, we talked earlier about uh, last time that I started my company with $250. That was just to pay for the LLC licensing uh, deal to get my taxes and everything set up. You know, that was just the licensing to get, to get the company started. Um, I started it with, you know, go look at uh, some, some of the products we did early on. Look at uh, Evocative City Sites, which is just public domain artwork, my writing, and a $20 black and white map. Those kind of things are the types of things that I'm talking about. Really, really small pieces, you know, all Evocative City Sites was was a single location with you know descriptions about who and what was there um, and told from a first person perspective. 
and I laid it out with Word and converted it into a PDF. And then, you know, I, I did the cover art in Word. You know, this is crazy stuff when, when designers look at me and get, you did what? Yeah, that's crazy talk. You should be using InDesign. You may not have access to those types of programs. You know, you may go find it, need to go find and use a pre free program like GIMP and learn how to use it. Um, I was a writer. I knew how to use Word extremely well. So, you know, there's still stuff that I do in Word that I shouldn't be doing in Word because I know it really well and I don't know InDesign very well. But that's why now I hire graphic designers. But you need to know how long, and layout artists, you need to know how long those people are going to take to produce a book. So to learn that type of thing, you need to start small. So let's say we've got our small little thing product that we're doing for Numenera, okay? Um, let's say we're doing a very small little PDF. Let's just say we're going to do a location uh, site, a little glimmer, if you will, of Numenera. This would be a, equivalent to an Evocative City site in, for Pathfinder for us. This might be equivalent to a Gossamer Worlds for Diceless. You know, it's a very similar product. It's not that hard to do. But you can create a unique and evocative location. It doesn't take a lot. And you don't need a lot of artwork for something like that because you just need basically the picture of what that place looks like. Um, you might get some pictures of NPCs, but here's the secret. If you're starting out for the first time, my desire for you is to work backwards. I want you to go find the artwork first. I want you to find a nice little location piece of artwork. It can be public domain. It can be stock art. It can be Creative Commons. I want you to go find that. Find that piece. And if you're really that good of an author, and you know, I'm speaking here as an author who this is the way I did it, so I'm passing that along to you because it's my experience, not my insight. Um, but you know, if you're an artist and can already do these things, this is even better. You draw the image, okay, and you have somebody write about it. You, you work backwards this way. Rather than writing the manuscript and then having to hire somebody to do artwork, which would be more expensive for you, you're a really talented writer. I'm sure you can find something really interesting about this first piece. So you write that piece, that take that piece, find a piece of artwork that fits within your, you know, dream project, your setting. You can use it later. You know, maybe it'll 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 be the teaser to get you into that that bigger project. But you're gonna have to draw people in. So let's say you're doing this little glimmer, this tiny piece, this little setting location, and you find you know the really nice piece of artwork, and then you write about it. Well, you're gonna have to decide what format you're gonna write it in. You know, that might be decided by looking at somebody else's work for Numenera. That might be decided by what kind of books you like. You know, I'm a big fan of, like, Volo's books. I love those types of first-person things, and that's what drove a lot of the evocative city sites, the Volo's guides. And so that's the kind of style I wrote in. But um, then you have to find your own unique twist on how you're going to write it and make it interesting. It's going to draw people in again. But this is your small project. You're going to learn how long it takes you to write. You know, can you write 22,000 words in a month? Can you do that in 30 days? Um, you know, can, can you set aside that kind of time and get that kind of turnover out? Um, can you, um, can your artist turn that around in 60 days? Can you find the type of artwork that you're looking for if you're just looking for stock art? Now you hand it off to your editor. How long is your editor going to take to edit your manuscript? How long is it going to take you to learn to do layout? You know, or how long is it going to take the layout artist you hired? And really, from the beginning, I'm really, really recommending you do everything yourself. So not only so that you learn to do it, because when somebody fails to do it, you're going to be the one who has to pick up the ball. You know, whether it's the artist, you know, tells you he's not going to finish it or he doesn't bother to contact you at all and blows the deadline. That will never happen to you, I promise. Yes, it will totally happen to you more often than you'd like. You know, can you talk to another artist who will turn it around or do you just go find stock art and fill it in? Um, that type of choice and you need to learn where those things can happen along the way. Um, you need to learn how long does it take you to promote a piece of work? Um, to get people interested. You know, where are you going to promote these uh, pieces of work? There's a little thing on my blog called Free Beer um, that is basically like eight or nine ways to promote your book for free. Um, 
and this is one of the ways I do it, just by doing a video blog and talking about my stuff. But this type of project is, again, small, it's tiny, you're going to learn a lot from it. Um, you're going to learn about the marketing of your book, you're going to learn about selling it. Maybe you're the very first book, you'll just give away, you know, to give people a teaser and a taste of what you're going to be doing. You, you, the second book you do after that will be your money maker. So, you know, you want to do high quality, but you don't want to invest a lot of money in that first piece. Um, that will draw more and more people in. That's the kind of thing that you're looking to do. Uh, you get people started with it. You know, there's some people who release the first adventure in their adventure path for free. I think they're crazy. You might not agree with me. Um, but there's a lot of people who, you know, you go one way or the other. You can make it pay what you want. You can learn a lot. You know, you'll get a lot more free stuff sold, but that doesn't necessarily mean people are play, paying it and using it. There's a value associated with paying for something um, besides free. People tend to put value on it. They don't they don't put value on it unless they had to put val put value forth. Uh, that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around sometimes. You think the free would be cooler, but sometimes paying for it is cooler to people because it's rarer. It means that not as many people have it, you know, that you found something cool nobody else has access to. Little things like that. But, uh, yeah, starting off small, keeping that ends. So now I'll come back to you again and say, oh, but Steve, there's no way I can start small. I only want to work on my new campaign setting that I have because it's so awesome and everybody will buy it. Okay. First off, even if it is that awesome, how are people going to know about it? You don't have the marketing experience yet. You don't have the mailing list developed yet. You don't have the platform to launch it. Even if you put it on Kickstarter the very first day and, and try to take advantage of that mall, nobody knows you. Nobody's going to trust you to produce an entire manuscript, an entire book, and because you have no experience doing it. You know, this is the advantage that established freelancers have, established companies do, because they know how to do this and they've proven they can do it. Well, you have to prove yourself as well, and that's why you should start smaller. But you're still stuck on the idea that, oh, I have to produce. It has to do with my campaign setting. Well, that's why I was trying to show you a small piece. You know, even if it's just your new game system with all the coolest mechanics that everybody will want to use because they're so innovative. Okay, first of all, they're not that innovative. Anybody who comes to me with a mechanic, we can probably look at the history of the tabletop RPG industry now and find math that's similar to yours. Um, you know, it, there's systems out there that are extremely elegant. They've done it better than you have. Trust me, it's out there. Um, th there's just a big history to that. You know, you, you, you can do your research. But let's say you you are that innovative. Let's skip that whole uh, pessimism on my part and say that it is that innovative. But again, people still don't know you, so they're not going to trust you that it's that innovative. So you need to develop that rapport by, again, starting small, learning these things, developing your mailing list, developing your contacts in the industry so people will help you promote your book. Um, it's one of the big things. You'll notice like when Monty Cook or just recently Robert Schwab uh, goes out there and uh, promotes new products, their big thing is um, they've got a new release and all of their friends talk about it because they want to help them. So that spreads it even further. That's the kind of grassroots you're going to need and it's going to take time. So again, start small. You know, small can be anywhere from a 10 page PDF to a 32 page book. But, I'm, but don't try to do a 320 page, you know, hardcover, full color, you know, with textbook spines and silk uh, bookmarks, that kind of thing. Don't try to do that your first thing out. Please. It's just you're going to make so many mistakes and you're going to regret it. Trust me. Uh, I did that kind of stuff. You know, where I tried to do something like Here's the Jade Earth very early on, and I struggled and I struggled and I struggled because it took me a long time to learn how stupid I was being. 
you know, and now I can do those types of books because we've learned so much and we've got a great support staff underneath beneath us and a catch-all for when those people aren't available or make mistakes or, you know, just yesterday we're talking about Mike uh, Makator, you know, being killed in a car wreck. That can happen to you or one of your staff members. You know, I hate that. It, it bugs me every time I turn around and I see somebody in this industry who was cool to me like Mike was, die. But that can happen to freelancers, that can happen to, you know, you get, you get hit, by, hit by a car or a bus or whatever. Um, that kind of thing. I used to joke that I have a hit by, hit by a bus file now because of, you know, people having kids and wives and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't strike me as funny when something like that happens to someone I corresponded with. So, anyway, so I'm talking about keeping it small. So let's, there, and keep it inexpensive, in my opinion. You need to learn the economics of publishing a book in print and selling it and what it's going to cost you to buy it at cost and sell it at retail. And I really recommend you starting off with a soft cover uh, black and white interior book. You can have a color cover. It'll be pretty as all get out. Um, but don't go try to buy, you know, the first Wayne Reynolds piece that you want to do that your first time out the door. Um, you know, take a look at, you know, I, I created pathways to, to show new freelancers and people who are just really talented and they're within your budget. Um, you know, I'm very open that we pay $50 for that cover. Uh, image for that cover artwork and I, that's what I'll pay you know until inflation tells me I need to go to fifty five dollars or something like that um, I'll try to keep it within you know because I want to show you you can create a game within budget and that's one of the things uh, I want people to be aware of so um, we pay more for you know like adventure quarterlies cover and stuff like that but I wanted to show you that you didn't necessarily have to there was a way to do your cover to still make it look cool Look at Raging Swan Press and how they do their covers. Look at Traveler's covers. Those aren't expensive uh, covers at all. There's plenty of great looking covers out there that don't, you know. Daniel Solace is a master of taking stock art and creating beautiful games, much less, you know, the covers of books. There, there are people out there who can do that. Um, practice. Uh, Lewis Porter Jr. recommended a book to me called The Non-Designer's Design Book, and I recommend, you know, everybody check that out. I think it's in its fourth edition now, though I think Lewis recommends the third edition one. Um, but, you know, that type of thing is well worth your time uh, taking a look at and so that you can learn everything in the industry. But again, you come back to me and you say, but Steve, I want to do my masterpiece first. Yes, I know you do. And Again, I'm coming back to this time and time again because this is the exact conversation I had with someone at the Gen Con last year that he just kept coming back. But no, I can't. There's no way I can separate this out in small pieces. Well, you've got your game. You've got your game design. Did you not do a setting? Can't you break your setting down into tiny little locations? Can't you talk about particular uh, non-player characters? You don't have to do them with mechanics. There are plenty of books out there. Engine Publishing is an amazing company that shows you exactly how you can do uh, books that don't have anything to do with the game mechanics and have everything to do with, you know, not being being system agnostic. You know, they are awesome books, and I love Engine Publishing, and they put their stuff out there, and I bought every one. Um, but, you know, they do really great books and they they published a lot of material through Gnome Stew so they knew about produ their production schedules and so forth and they brought in smart talented people to handle the uh, layout and graphic design part so um, that's really what I'm talking about here is these are the things you need to learn and it's going to take time it's going to it's not going to be something that you do from the very start. You're not going to be awesome at this. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, and that's okay. But that's why you do this with a small book, um, starting out with small ideas and working your way up. You know, I really recommend starting with like a 10-page 
uh, PDF and learning how to produce that, learning how to release that, learning what your sales numbers are, and then working your way up from that to a 32 page uh, uh, PDF and then learning the that's a good number you can you can turn into print you know that's a nice adventure size 32 pages um, you can get bigger and do something more with deluxe like a 60 or 90 pager um, from there you just keep going and as you develop and create uh, new things you're gonna learn you know the production schedules you're gonna learn you know let's write the manuscript let's uh, edit it let's lay out the book uh, let's uh, insert let's make a mock layout and just insert you know a single piece of artwork in where we want art to appear so that we know what the dimensions of the artwork that we're going to order is um, and then we can order the custom art this time because we've we've gone so much farther along than we have before and uh, then we can you know learn all of the nuances of working with artists and how to write an art description uh, so that an artist understands what the hell you're talking about and including photo references for the artists so that it makes it easier on the artists I don't know you know making good pieces you know good uh, maps so that you know if you hire someone like Jonathan Roberts or uh, Tony Salama they can come in and you know look at your map and make actual sense of, of what it is you know um, that type of stuff is something you're going to be looking at you know so that if you give a description to someone like Jason Rainville or uh, Patricia Smith or um, just any number of the artists. There's so many I work with, it, it, it's crazy. But uh, Dennis Darmody or, you know, Keith Seymour or uh, just all of the folks that I work with. Um, any one of the, you know, you want to give good references, you know, photo references and so forth. You want to give good art descriptions. You know, once you get the, the, that art turned around, you get them paid on time. You know, um, you, they do the work, then they get paid. It's, that's the way it should be. That's the way it is. Plain and simple. None of this waiting 60 days or 30 days after the release of the product. I know of too many companies that never ever get around to paying their people, or if they do, it's a long, long time afterwards. Um, there's good companies out there that still do this. I even knew a company that did it with Kickstarter money, and that kind of stuff upsets me. Um, where they didn't pay the freelancers right away, they kept the money because they wanted it to be about the print run, and that's their choice, and that's how they can hire people, and those people agree to work with it. But it's not the way that I think business should be done, and nowhere else that I know of do you get paid like that. But um, I don't want to talk about that because that's getting into d dirty laundry we don't need to talk about. We're talking about you being a good company and you starting small so that you can learn. So, um, and then you've got your layout, you've got your file, you know, you've got your print file, you've got your thing. So you're going to put it through drive through lightning source. So you have a print on demand aspect. You're going to put it up on create space so that you can have it through Amazon and you can do that. Or, you know, you've, done your first Kickstarter and it's it gets really it gets done really really well but again I'm trying to talk about staying small first so we're gonna ignore Kickstarter for right now but you know you, you send it up to create space you send it up to lightning source maybe you did it for Pathfinder so you order some physical copies uh, from create space because the soft cover black and white and it's incredibly cheap through create space and you have it shipped to Liz Quartz over at Paizo and she sets it up on their store so that you can sell your Pathfinder stuff there or you know, maybe there's a site you want to send it to, send it to that's for indie stuff. Um, you know, maybe you want to say it to Indie Press Revolution store so they can sell it for you and have it at the conventions they go to. Or maybe you make a small agreement with um, a, a place like Studio Two Publishing as a as a fulfillment house, and you send them small copies, so because they do pre-orders and stuff, and you send them you know physical print copies that are just print on demand, and and until you hit a critical mass where you can start doing you know as you keep growing now all of this is the advice to start small that does not mean that people aren't successful who don't um, we were talking about Fire Mountain Games yesterday and about how they have a beautiful beautiful book with the way of the wicked and that was full out you know it's, a, it's the quality of Paizo it's full color 
It's gorgeous. It has amazing artwork. But that's a partnership between an established freelancer and an established uh, artist who's also, you know, who was also a freelancer. They did a lot of work for Fantasy Flight Games before they came over to do Pathfinder. That's the kind of stuff I'm telling you about. You need that experience. Uh, to, to learn to do that, especially if you're just, you know, going the self-publishing route and not learning to be a freelancer first. Um, I recommend spending some time being a freelancer, even if, you know, it's only a couple months, even if it's just a year. I, I think you'll learn a lot about production schedules that way, and you can ask questions. You know, it's good to have a mentor. You know, Wolfgang Barr was very kind and answered a lot of questions that I had when I was first starting. Um, uh, Owen Stevens has been an amazing... Uh, mentor to me on any number of subjects beyond publishing. Um, you know, it's a lonely road out here, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this. Uh, Gareth Skarka uh, spent a lot of time answering my questions too at conventions. Um, that kind of, um, you, you can't buy that kind of feedback from friends. So, um, anyway, again, my recommendation is still start small so you can learn a lot. Otherwise, you'll make all the mistakes I did and not bother to learn from watching this video. So this has been Stephen D. Russell talking about how to start your own tabletop role-playing game company. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this. I would ask all of you to go out and buy our most recent release, uh, the Kaiju Codex for Pathfinder. Uh, I'd also ask you to go out and look forward to the 13th Age uh, product, The Breaking of Thostar Nagar, adventure for that. That's in uh, full color print as well as PDF. And we're also going to be offering, uh, uh, next week we'll be offering uh, a new piece for the Lords of Gossamer Shadowline. We'll be doing Gossamer World's Dragon Hearth. So please check those out. Um, keep me in business so that I can keep making these uh types of videos. Um, we're going to be talking next time about creating a volume of work and we're going to be talking a little bit about some advice from Ira Glass uh, next time about taste and execution. So we'll be going over that next time on our video and how that affects your uh, company as you develop this first product. So because you're not just training yourself to learn the business, you're training your, it's training your talent. But again, we're going to be talking about that next time. Thank you so much again. Uh, this has been Right Designs. Have a very good day and good game.